Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we are delving into some truly creepy stories. I hope you're ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Years ago, when I was in jail, I used to pray every night. When you're little and you pray, it's because you want something from the world that you don't know how to get. And when you're older, it's because the world wants something from you that you don't know how to give. The lights would go out at 11pm, and I would pray to be a better man, humiliating myself before the arbitrary silence of my thoughts, begging and pleading and even screaming when the thoughts became too loud to contain. Then one night, an unscheduled cell search interrupted my routine. The inmates all had to wait against the wall while our block was cleared. And it wasn't until after midnight when I was able to begin my prayers. All those years, my mother used to drag me down to the church. She never once told me that God isn't the one who listens to midnight prayers. I began as I always do. I kneel on my bed, close my eyes, and with my hands clasped together, I'll ask, is anyone listening? This was the first night that someone answered. Yes. I didn't dare open my eyes, terrified that the reality of my cell would be all I saw. The voice was soft, patient, and infinitely sad, as though it had seen and heard more than its heart could bear, but had such respect for the suffering that it stoically refused to turn away. I'm afraid, I said, because I knew at once that I could not lie to such a voice. I'm afraid that I'm going to die in here, that the world has decided who I am because of one mistake and that there's nothing I'll ever be able to do to convince them otherwise. You are right to be afraid. You will die in this cell, the voice said. My whole body went tense. For a moment I thought I was talking to a guard who was trying to screw with me. But the calm certainty of the voice was enough for me to keep my eyes closed and believe. If I couldn't have faith here and now, what hope did I ever have? But that doesn't mean that this is the end. Your body has been branded and discarded, the voice continued. Do not waste any more time trying to save what is already lost. My soul then. Your soul is hungry to keep living, and this is how you must feed it. Find and kill a human and then take your own life. When these eyes close for the last time, the eyes of your victim will open and you will be looking out. The strain to look at my saviour was excruciating, but some instinctual terror forbade me. Either I would look upon some unspeakable abomination and be forced to abandon my hope of a new life, or I'd see some imposter and know it to be a lie. And if I don't like who I've become, I can kill again. I barely breathed the words. Will I become a new person each time? As many times as you like, purred the presence. When you're old and tired, taking a child will let dance this mad show again. My mind was racing immediately, disgusted, but enthralled by the idea. And if I die by chance, if I'm hit by a car or something, and I haven't killed anyone yet, where will I go? That will be up to me to decide. The voice was smiling now. I don't know how, but I knew. 
I couldn't take it anymore. If this was some sick joke, then I wanted to know before I betrayed anything anymore. I opened my eyes and flung myself in a rapid dash against my cell door. There was no one on the other side. No one in the corridor which stretched open before me. The voice did not speak to me again. I have prayed to be a good man, and this is how my prayers were answered. I will become a good man, but I had to find and kill him first. Killing another inmate would be pointless. Why start life again in another cell? It had to be a guard. Someone with access to the outside, so that I could make my way out and then kill again. It took about a week for me to get a metal shiv that would be up to the job. I took my victim into the yard during the bedlam of gang squabble. He was innocent of everything, but standing next to me when the opportunity arose. And I do not wish to dwell on the incident with any more detail than that. I only had a few seconds before the other guards tackled me, but it was enough to force the shiv into my own heart. And the light bled from me and the pain dissolved into oblivion. I prayed again for forgiveness. No answer came, but the welcome darkness. And the searing white light, which roused me in the hospital. I wasn't shackled. There was a woman leaning over my bed, shedding tears of joy that I was all right. Her name was Mariah, and she didn't know that she was a widow now. There was a boy who wouldn't stop wailing and laughing. He didn't know his father had died on that prison yard, or that I had taken his place. Was it a kindness that kept me from telling them the truth? They were so happy that I was alive, that they readily accepted my memory loss, although I did seem to maintain some of his muscle memories and habits. It started off as guilt, that made me unwilling to leave them. But guilt alone could not endure through the years as I have done. You probably wouldn't believe me if I told you I loved them as strongly as they love me. But waking up with my new wife and staying strong for my boy, I've never been so happy as that. I lived with them for five years until I suffered a minor heart attack. I felt like a ticking time bomb after that. The big one could happen any day, and this new life I had worked so hard for would be replaced by some unspeakable unknown. Giving up this new life would be the hardest thing I'd ever have to do. But I couldn't take the anxious suspense any longer. It was time to kill again, and again, and again. I wouldn't let myself get tied down like that again. That one was famous, or another had a better house, or a hotter wife. The lives were a blur, fading in and out so quickly that I became everyone and yet no one. It turns out killing people is quite easy. It's not getting caught that's hard. But since I always sacrificed my own life in the same moment, getting caught was never an issue. I wanted to experience everything that life had to offer. One day, I was a schoolgirl. The next, I was a professional athlete or a race car driver. Taking highly skilled people was my favorite because with little practice and their muscle memory, I was just as good as they ever were. I spent several years as a number of prominent musicians leaving a wake of scandals as I inevitably took my own life to move on. I don't know how many lifetimes I could have spent this way, but I never had the chance to explore them all. I was using a healthy body to experiment with a variety of drugs. When I was ambushed by an undercover cop, I didn't have a chance to switch bodies again. And before I knew what was happening, I was back in jail. It was a minor possession charge and I had plenty of money hidden away for bail, so I didn't make any fuss. The point is, 
that I saw her again at the station. Mariah was dating again. I guess she had a thing for a man in uniform. Seeing her sitting and laughing, knowing that she moved on from me so easily, it just made my blood boil. I guess I hadn't realised until that moment that throughout all the glamorous lives I'd lived over the last few years, I hadn't once been as happy as I was as when I was with her. It wasn't as easy as I thought to slip back in. I killed her new boyfriend without trouble, but she didn't stay with me long. It was as though she noticed the change right away, dumping me almost as soon as I stepped foot in her house. It took two more bodies trying to seduce her, only to be turned away each time. Frustrated, I consented to bide my time, waiting until she began dating again, so that I could replace him and have her. Three boyfriends later, the same story each time. I killed each of them, only to be rejected the moment I appeared in their body. It seemed as though she could sense my presence somehow, but each time she turned me away, I only wanted her more. It didn't help that she was becoming unstable. I hadn't counted on how psychologically devastating it must be to continue dating new people and yet sense that they are all the same. She practically stopped going outside altogether, and I was going crazy trying to figure out how to reach her. You don't know how much it hurt me to tell you what happened next. This is my confession, and before God, and the man and otherwise, I wish my sins to be known. There was one person in her life that Mariah would never abandon, and children are always the easiest of targets. I caught him leaving school one day. He's been taking the bus since his mum started locking herself in. I was wearing the body of a policeman he'd grown up around, and he'd had no reason to suspect my intentions when I offered him a ride. I didn't drive him home though. I was taking him out into the woods where there wouldn't be a scene. Trying to get close to Mariah through her son might seem strange to you, but after living so many lives, I wasn't encumbered with such artificial distractions as romance or maternal love. I wanted to be close to her again. I wanted her to love me. And if she was too broken to love another man, then I was willing to make a compromise on her behalf. Get out of the car. I ordered the boy who was once my son. Where are we? I thought we were going home. Just get out. Those big almond eyes stared at me for a long time. Then he smiled. Okay, I trust you. We're going to play a game, okay? I've got out of the car with him. My hand was cramping up from flexing beside my gun. Okay, close your eyes. Okay. Don't open them. Promise me. Okay, Dad. He closed his eyes. My blood froze. Why'd you call me that? I asked. Sorry. His little brow furrowed in deep thought. I don't know. It's just that you smell like him. Only I don't feel it in my nose. Where do you feel it? The boy crossed his heart, still clenching his eyes shut. I slid my gun back into its holster. The game goes like this. You count to a hundred while I hide. When you open your eyes, you have to find me. Ready? Ready. When we finished playing, I told him to get back in the car and we drove back to his home. I didn't go in to see Mariah. I just dropped him off and didn't look back. No matter what happens from this moment on, I know this life is going to be my last. I know it doesn't mean much, but for what it's worth, I'm staying on as a cop. I'm going to protect that boy and his mother for the rest of my life. And when chance or old age takes me at last, I'll deserve whatever happens to me next. I have prayed to be a good man, and this is how my prayers are answered.
Me and the guys were just doing a sweep of an old oil refinery when I found the eggs. I guess they liked the heat because they were all clustered right around the fractal distillation chamber, which gets up past 720 Fahrenheit when the crude oil is being heated up. The whole building was scheduled for demolition though, and it was our job to make sure the place was cleaned out. Anyone want a souvenir? I shouted. Guess the crew was in the other parts of the building. The eggs were about the size of my fist, all black and covered with thick bristles, like an especially paranoid cactus. Only one of them was really even intact. Maybe it's because the refinery hadn't been running in a while, but five out of the six eggs were cracked and leaking some kind of thick, rotten smelling jelly. I was more motivated by the clock than curiosity though, and I was about to mark the room as clear when a souvenir? Wanna want a souvenir? The voice was muffled and frail, but it was definitely coming from inside the egg. I crouched down next to it, scooping up the tiny ball in my worker's gloves. So what are you supposed to be? Supposed to be, was all that it chirped back. Yeah, maybe it was the fumes in this place getting to my head, but there was something profoundly sad about that little echo. I dropped the egg in my pocket of my overalls, intending to show it off to everyone at the pub after work. Intending being the key word there. We didn't finish clearing the place until almost six, and then there was a last minute permit issue that had me driving around collecting signatures until past nine. I was dead tired and so ready to collapse at home that I barely remembered the weird egg in my pocket. If it wasn't for the little spikes, it would have been forgotten entirely. It must have liked my warmth though, because it seemed to keep trying to huddle closer to me in my pocket. When I got home and put it on the counter, I could actually hear a soft rattle as its spines shivered against the tile. You got a name? I asked it. You got... You got... Can't you say anything more? I'm Phil. You got... A Phil. That's all it could do. Echo me. Was I with it out? Yeah, sure, but it was cool too. I felt like a hero for saving it, and I guess I was feeling protective, because I hated watching it tremble like that. I put the thing on an oven rack and set it to 100 Fahrenheit, keeping the light on and checking on it occasionally. Any more, Phil? Anything more? Just still an echo, but it felt like there was more deliberate thought behind it. The voice was getting stronger, but it was still shivering. I turned the heat up incrementally, and it continued to encourage me until I hit the max temperature of 550. I figured that if it could survive being pressed up the fractional distillation chamber, then it could survive this too. The egg seemed to be loving it sure enough. Supposed to be, thank you, Phil. I never remembered saying thank you but it could have picked that up whilst listening to me from inside my pocket. I was only intending to let it bake and warm up for a little while, but I was so tired that I just fell asleep on the couch, watching TV. Phil, 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 Phil! Shrill, insistently urgent. The first sound I heard when I woke up, still half asleep, I raced to the oven and turned on the light, Thick black jelly was dripping through my oven rack. Had I accidentally killed it? I opened the door and a wave of sulfuric air brutally forced itself into my nose and down my throat. I gagged and reeled back desperately searching for an oven mitt to save the little guy. The shell had been shattered into a dozen pieces and there was nothing inside but the charcoal goo. Phil, over here! Look what I found! It wasn't dead, it was hatched. 
and it was peeking out from my cupboard with a bottle of seasoning in each hand. Wide red eyes without pupil or cornea took up the entirety of its face. Black skin with green fuzzy splotches like fresh moss. Two long fingers on each hand with little mouths on each end of it, which it was speaking from. I wasn't afraid of it or anything, but shit was I surprised. It had already formed a perfect circle of spilled herbs and spices on my counter. There was a wide assortment of opened bottles and jars that would stick its fingers into before deciding whether to spill the contents into the circle or not. Stop that, you're making a mess. Phil, 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 it's a circle, Phil. It squealed with pride. What the hell are you? The hell? The hell you? It mimicked in a voice which was obviously a crude impersonation of me. I spent the next 20 minutes chasing it through my apartment, trying to trap or corner it somewhere. Of course, the little bugger thought it was just a game, and squealed and giggled with delight as it evaded my grasp over and over. I briefly considered calling my landlord, but somehow this seemed like something that would end up adding to my next rent payment. I was already late for the demolition though, and I couldn't fool around forever. Eventually, I lured it back into the oven where it seemed almost comfortable and slammed the door tight. I used a bike lock to secure the oven shut and crank the heat down to 220 and left for work. I was worried about leaving that thing in my apartment all morning, but I managed to sneak off on my lunch break, race home and check on it. Just seeing that my building hadn't burned down or anything was a bigger relief than I realised. Then there was a palpable tension as I opened my door, half expecting my place to be torn to shreds. Everything was exactly as I'd left it, even the oven was still closed. Although, the bike lock was on the ground and it had been turned back up to 550. I took a deep breath and turned on the oven light. Jumping back, I saw the wide red eyes blinking in sluggish contentment on the other side of the glass. No harm done. I fastened the lock back on, this time pushing a heavy recliner to block the door as well. Imagine my surprise when I saw the creature hiding under the chair I was moving, or the bump from inside the cupboards, or the squealing giggles coming from my bedroom. I counted at least six of them before my lunch break was over, and the more I searched, the more circles I began to find. On the carpet, in the closet, on top of the TV, little circles of herbs and spices, and when they ran out of those, they improvised with whatever they could get their hands on. Mustard, mayonnaise, crumbled chips, there must have been a hundred circles in my place. Meanwhile, my phone was ringing every five minutes, the demolition crew yelling at me wondering where I was. I couldn't leave them in here, God knows what they get up to. I couldn't stay to watch them either though. I just opened a window and did my best to chase as many of them out as I could. They seemed bigger than they were this morning, almost the size of my head now, and their strong fingers had no trouble scaling down the brick building to escape. Anything more, Phil? Perhaps that was the original one, but I couldn't tell for sure. It clung to the outside of my building, hesitating to look back at me. Supposed to be happy here, Phil. Supposed to be home. My phone was ringing again, so goddamn impatient. Answering with one hand, I grabbed a broom in the other to push the creature further away from the window, hoping the rest of them would find their way out when they were ready. I followed the siren call of my cell phone and went back to work. That was the last time I've seen one of them and I guess I should be thankful for that, but I'm not. I could tell something was seriously wrong when I was still a few blocks away from home. A dozen trash cans were lined up in the centre of the road, and I had to get out of my car to move them. All the trash had been removed, and it was spread on either side of the cans in the shape of a long, evenly curving line. When the trash had run out, it was replaced with anything and everything to continue the unbroken line. 
broken wood, loose bricks, stolen bikes and street lights all jumbled together. It just looked like a giant mess here. But I bet if I looked from the air, it would be shaped like a perfect circle. Two or three, maybe half a mile wide. Please, tell me that's not another summoning circle. 11.50pm on New Year's Eve. The racious beat of the music is echoed by the pulse in my veins. Iridescent lights lance through the air all around me, and the teeming heat of pressed bodies forces me to swallow great lungfuls of heavy air, thick with sweat and cheap perfume. I can't be the only one who isn't dancing. But anyone who notices me will immediately recognize that I don't belong here. Smiles and sniggers look the same to me, and all laughter is tainted with condescending jokes at my expense. Living with crippling anxiety is my personal nightmare. Just trying to start a conversation with someone feels like standing on the roof of a tall building. One little push and I'm free. The clenching knot in my stomach has frozen me in place. I must have started walking towards Chase at the DJ table a dozen times so far at this party, but I've never gotten within a few feet before I had the irresistible urge to check my phone, go to the bathroom, or disappear off the face of the earth entirely. Guys like Chase don't look twice at girls like me. It doesn't matter if we like all the same music. It doesn't matter if there is electricity which ignites the air between us. Maybe things would be different if he was the one to say hi first. But how was that supposed to happen when I couldn't even get close to him? Looks like you could use a drink. I don't understand how I heard the words so clearly over the pounding music, but I didn't turn to the barman. Maybe if he thought I didn't hear them, he'd give up and leave me alone. Maybe too. What's your poison? He insisted. I don't drink. I dismissed him over my shoulder. You mean, you didn't used to drink? I finally turned to see an elderly man with a closely groomed grey beard and a vest which fits so closely that it might as well have been sewn onto his skin. His dark eyes drilled into me with undistinguished fascination. You didn't used to do a lot of things, he continued. There was a time you'd never walked before, but then you started, and you haven't stopped since. Now it would be silly to say you don't walk, wouldn't it? You aren't even the same person who couldn't walk anymore. What do you mean, not the same person? A sudden lull in the music was punctured by Chase's voice on the loudspeaker. Five minutes to midnight, who's ready to burn the rest of the year? He was answered by an overwhelming cheer. But the old man's words still clearly punctured the chaos. I mean you're remembering someone else's memories. Next year you'll be new again, and then you'll remember all the memories you have now, and think that they're yours. You'll have all the same habits, be afraid of all the same things, because you think that's who you're supposed to be. But it's not. The new you will have to decide for herself, whether she wants to keep copying a failing strategy, or learn from it and try something else. I don't have a failing strategy, you don't even know me. How could I? He replied promptly. You're a blank slate tonight. Even you don't know you yet. So how about that drink? I nodded, not fully understanding why. He spoke with such a simple surety that I couldn't muster anything to refute him. The barman pulled a purple bottle from under the shelf and spun it deftly between his hands. A fountain of thick, rich liquid, like cough syrup, sprouted into a perfectly placed mug, which I hadn't noticed a moment before. 
What is it? Just what you need. Cheers. He poured a second glass for himself and toasted me. May we make room for new growth by pruning the dead branches, and may we leave what's dead behind. I took a long drink, forcing myself not to gag as the thick liquid dribbled down my throat like oil. He finished first, slamming his glass upon the table and wiping his beard with the back of his hand. Before I had a chance to finish mine, the barman added, Those who die a little each night will never feel the pain of those who go all at once. You're the lucky ones. Huh? I wiped the last of the thick residue from my mouth. It's almost midnight. Are you ready to let the old you die? Almost midnight. I was running out of time. I felt a certain tranquility while walking towards the DJ table. The old me would have turned away by now, but I didn't slow down even when Chase looked right at me. The electricity wasn't a barrier anymore. It was charging me, an exhilarating fuel which propelled me through the churning dance floor. I even allowed myself to step in time with the music, bobbing and swaying with the mesmerizing beat. It almost felt like I was flying, until suddenly I was close enough to finally say, Hey Chase. My wildest paranoia couldn't have prepared me for his reaction. Glancing up from his computer, Chase's face contorted into a horrified caricature of his self-assurance. He lurched out his chair so fast that it tumbled over backwards. I rushed to help him, but that only made him kick the chair in my direction and scramble across the floor. The music was deafening this close to the speakers, but it wasn't enough to completely drown out the grotesque retching as he vomited on the floor. Through the beat, I could still clearly hear the wailing sob rising in my throat as I sprinted away from him and turned to the bathroom. I couldn't understand what happened until the burning began. My fingers gingerly grazed the swiftly swelling lumps on my face. I covered myself with my hands as I ran brutally shoving my way through the crowd and then slamming through the bathroom door. A girl in a black sequence party dress dropped her makeup and screamed. I almost trampled her on my way to the mirror, but she wasted no time in ducking under the sink and crawling towards the door. Looking in the mirror, I honestly couldn't blame her. Some of the lumps in my skin were the size of golf balls, and they were growing by the second. The larger ones were actually wriggling, almost as though there were an insect squirming just beneath the skin. More lumps were appearing on my hands, and the itching, burning radiating down my body left no ambiguity about what was happening under my clothes. I would have screamed if my tongue weren't swelling too, but it was all I could do. Just try to keep my airway clear. Then the first boil popped, and I couldn't contain the howl which ripped from my lungs. I heard the door open, but it snapped shut immediately. I couldn't tear my eyes away from the mirror. More boils were rupturing by the second, splattering the glass with thick purple syrup, which clung on like long strands of mucus. More of them exploded in my mouth to trickle down my throat with the same oily taste of the drink. My hair was sliding from my scalp in great clumps, matted and greased with the bubbling purple liquid. The only thing which kept me from completely losing my mind was the sight of fresh pink skin which shone beneath the savage gashes in my face. The burn was growing more intense by the second, but each exploding boil revealed more healthy skin below it. I started ripping at the tattered shreds, peeling them and dumping them in a soggy pile around my feet. Beneath all the skin that was falling off, I didn't even recognize myself. My new skin was lighter and clearer, and the new hair which sprouted was a short ruffled blonde that was nothing like the long dark hair which lay in clumps around my feet. 
nothing was the least recognisable, except my eyes, which were stretched wide with a familiar anxious terror. What the hell? Chase must have been following me into the bathroom, as those were the words that exited his mouth. How long had he been watching? Long enough. I stepped away from the wet pile of old flesh that littered the ground. My clothes were still soaked in the liquid though, and more chunks continued to rain out my dress and down my legs. He looked like he was about to vomit again. Hey Chase, I want to try something, come here. He didn't move, but he didn't have to. I crossed the space between us more quickly than I thought possible, and all at once our faces were inches apart but he didn't turn away. Outside, I could hear the countdown towards midnight. Five. I pressed my finger to his lips to silence the budding question. Four. I cupped his head in my hands and drew him towards me. Three. I felt his hard lips soften against mine. Two. The taste of his sweat as my mouth made its way down his neck. One? The squirt of blood through my teeth as they sank into his flesh. He was thrashing now, but each movement just forced my jaw to tighten until I could feel the first vertebra crunch under the pressure. All the shouts of Happy New Year drowned out his terminal scream, which strangled to a whisper when his trachea collapsed. Part of me died that night, alongside Chase, but the old man knew what he was talking about. It's much easier to leave your dead parts behind than let them weigh you down. And for the first time in my life, I'm not afraid anymore. The devil is known for his patience. He will see a ripening sin in our youth, and wait all the long years of our life before the harvest. And why shouldn't he? What is one more soul to the untold billions in his dominion? What is one more year in the infinite span of his corrupted reign? Perhaps by waiting. He is even giving us a chance to spend our lives repenting for what we've done. But I wouldn't know. Sins such as mine are so terrible that no absolution is possible. So I suppose there was no reason for him to wait. He came for me in the woods while the mutilated woman I killed was still in my arms, warming my body with her blood. It's strange that I cannot remember why I even killed her, or even who she is. But this feeling of guilt so permeates my being, that I would have walked to hell myself if I had known the way. I will not waste effort describing the devil. The impoverished words at my disposal have only been designed for this material world. Even as he stood before me, he was more removed from my understanding than the glorious sun was to a blind worm. It is suffice to say that he could not be perceived with any one of the senses, but the pressure of his presence so commanded my consciousness that I was aware of nothing else. Escape was impossible. Words were meaningless. I let this woman slip from my arms and stood to face him with all the dignity remaining to a man so removed from God. When he turned from me and began to walk through the fading light of this dying world, I kept pace with him and did not turn to either side. Where we walked, I do not know but it seemed as though he could have relived my entire life in the time it took for him to stop. As long as he was beside me, I could not make sense of what else might be. Even the thoughts in my head 
and the temperature on my skin were insignificant to his companionship. As terrifying as it was to know my fate, I had found certain tranquility in the mindless journey at his side. Now that I could feel him begin to depart, however, my mind revolted, as though starting from a nightmare, I forced out the first thought I could muster to delay his departure. Who was she? You will suffer more if you do not know. And he was gone. And with him, the curtain lifted within me to reveal the horror of his empire I now found myself mirad within. Perhaps it would be more accurate to call hell a person than a place, however, considering the unceasing sentient screams which pummeled me from the land itself. Writhing shadows sensitive to the touch, grasping endlessly at me with hands that were not hands, Endless cities sprawled before me as open wounds upon the rotting corpse that I stood upon. The sky was unobstructed by stars, instead vaulting endlessly into a timeless abyss. And looking at it, I experienced the ghastly sensation of balancing on an eroding precipice, which poised to tumble me endlessly into its yawning void. Charnel winds slithered their way into my nose and mouth with tangible substance, forcing me to let oiled coils like writhing serpents penetrate my lungs with each breath. Beyond the cities in the distance rose the obscured ghost of monstrous beings and gods who roared in endless decay which fate had forgotten them to. Through this blasphemous temple, to the end of the universe I went, cowed constantly by half-conceived winged terrors, which beat the air with a sound like the ceaseless wet bludgeoning of fists on flesh. There are two kinds of pain which I had come to expect from the world of the living. The physical, and the emotional. Never had I experienced a physical pain so excruciating as the boils which began to swell across my body, nor the mental burdens as debilitating as the taunting echoes which sneered at me from the living tissue beneath my feet. Every good memory of my life was poisoned against me, and each shame and guilt was mangled a thousand times over by the leering spectators which narrated my ordeals with intimate knowledge and exaggerated effect. Worse than either was the spiritual pain I endured, however, the gnawing hopelessness and depression which robbed even my sense of self. I was not a person in hell. I was hell. I did not feel pain. I was pain, inseparable and indistinguishable. It was then, in the lowest reduction of my humanity, as I crawled across the putrid ground in a trail of my own ruptured boils, that she took pity on me. Gentle hands shed my skin from me, not as a torment, but as a release. My disfigured limbs were cut away by her flashing knife, each slice bringing a pain so pure and clean that I welcomed it without question. Layer by layer, she flayed me, until at last there was nothing left to cut but my soul. Again, it is difficult to describe her without the resilience of my moral senses, now stripped from me. But if you understood me when I told you that I was pain, you will understand again when I tell you that she was beauty. My husband was wrong about you, she told me. You didn't kill anyone, and you don't deserve to be here. I'm going to help you escape. 
I couldn't comprehend how anything could exist outside of this. What universe would accept me? As torn and broken as I was. What universe could accept, knowing it had the capacity to so punish an innocent soul? I don't deserve it. What left of me, I replied. I know I killed her. It's something you can never cut from me. She killed herself by loving you. And for that, you are not to blame. Do you see these hands? When she cupped my hands in her own, I knew she was creating them as she spoke. Clean, strong hands, untouched by the blemishes of hell. These hands could never be used for hurt. These eyes could never look upon such evil as its own creation. I didn't even have a face before she spoke, but my entire body was growing with each word. It was as though the seed of my soul was sprouting new life. Shards of bone lanced out and flourished with muscles like thickening bark. Organs dropped and swelling like ripening fruit, and the network of veins and arteries blossomed towards her as though seeking nourishment from the sun. Through the macabre landscape we sped, dancing across the festering world as softly as light through a drop of water. I could see her more clearly, and further we traversed, although she never stayed still long enough for me to get a proper look. Bare feet skipped across the rotten land and twirled her through the looming spectres which besought us on all sides. It is a wonder that the oppression of this unending night had failed to extinguish her spark, and invigorated by the purity of her wake. I was whole again. You are his wife, then? It was difficult to speak to her as we raced, but I managed to slip in a few words every time I was able to draw near. We are bound to each other, yes, she replied. And then she was gone again, leaping fearlessly between fragile grips as she vaulted upwards. I followed her, up the torturous broken hands the size of hillsides, which stretched vainly from the ground towards the vacuous sky. Of all the madness in this cursed place, that must be king. My husband is not mad, and neither am I for being with him, she replied. She was pulling herself up, through the fingers now, stopping to wait for me atop one of their monstrous joints. And if I were to love you instead, I asked, would that be mad as well? She smiled at me and stretched her slender hand to help me clamber up beside her. We sat together, staring upwards from the bottom of an endless sky, the slightest brush of her leg against my own, intoxicating me with rapture. All love is paradoxically mad, she replied. It is an assault on reason, but in doing so it creates its own reason. But it won't do any good, because this is where you have to leave. And will you leave with me? She shook her head. You can't prefer to stay here. She nodded, saying, But you are free now, and that is what matters. All you must do is jump from this point, and with the body I have given you, you will be able to fall all the way back until you've left hell altogether. I've already left hell, I said, since the moment you found me. And if I were to leave you here, then I know wherever I found myself would be hell again without you there. You are being silly wasting time. If my husband finds you with me, he won't, because you're coming with me. I cut her off, preferring not to dwell on the thought of being found. I can't. I made a promise. Then I can't either, and that's my promise to you. To prove my point, I even slipped down the finger we sat upon and began crawling backwards towards the massive palm. Stop it! If he'll find you, he'll... He'll what? I shouted back. What can he possibly do that he hasn't done already? 
I saw in her something I could not live without, and she must have seen something in me that she could not let die. I hadn't even made it back to the giant palm before her hands clasped me and heaved me back onto the twisted finger. We stood there for a while longer, together, hand in hand, staring up at the terrifying fall. Then the wet bludgeoning drums of the winged creatures began, and I could feel the tension wash through her body. I watched her, although she could not meet my gaze. And just the drumming began to close in around us, I felt her coil to leap. We jumped together, flying and falling simultaneously, in a dizzying tumble. The massive hand snatched at us as we began to depart, but it was too slow to prevent our liberation. The entire world screamed with more agony than could be contained. But though the lands reverberated with its echoes, even this deafening cacophony was quickly falling behind. The gut-clenching freefall distracted my attention, but I never let go of her hand as we whirled through the timeless void. It wasn't until the initial exhilaration began to fade when I could tell that something was wrong. I didn't have to look at her to feel her hand withering in my grasp. Her skin wrinkled and dried as though years of heat began into it. Her skin wrinkled and dried as though years of heat beat into it with every second we passed together. Soon it began to crack and bleed, washing me with her warm blood. While I still felt healthy and strong, I was forced to watch with helpless terror as her body was devastated by the passage through the void. Her smooth hair began to mould and free fall in greasy clumps. Her face was torn, as though blasted by relentless sand, and though her fingers clutched on to me ever more desperately, I could feel the strength fleeing from them. No torment in hell could match the guilt, knowing she was enduring this for me. As the spinning abyss began to slow, I was able to swim through the air and clutch her onto me, cradling her in my arms as her body continued to deteriorate. Blood was now flowing freely from a thousand sourceless wounds. When finally the black sky relinquished us back into the woods where I began, I was soaked in her blood and my own freely falling tears. Staring at her mutilated form, she was completely unrecognisable from before. My head was clouded, as though freshly waking up from a dream, and though I tried to hold on to the details, they were stolen from my mind with an inexorable decay. Soon I could not even remember who I was holding, or how she'd gotten there. All I knew is that it was my fault, and the weight of the guilt which her death bade me carry, when the devil came for me again. I knew I would follow him willingly, no matter what horror lay in store for me. I knew I deserved it, for what I had done. My mother costs $10,000. That's the standard price for a hit. My father was 25000 because he was considered an important person. At least, important enough to demand a formal investigation into his death. From what I've heard, the police never found anything besides the single razor blade used to cut each of their throats. Of course, I know who did it. I even saw it happen. But I never had the chance to tell anyone before I was taken. No kids. That's Mr. Dakin's only rule as far as I can tell. The killer doesn't like to leave behind orphans either. So after my parents were dead, he took me with him. I remember being too afraid to even look him in the face. I just stared at the blood dripping from his black leather gloves while he talked, not hesitating to obey when he told me to get into his car. When you're not looking at the black gloves, Mr. Dakin doesn't seem like a killer. His face is warm, 
and doughy with nothing but a mischievous twinkle in the eye to hint at what he's capable of. His voice is soft and low, a patient professor subtly guiding you toward discovery. A couple of the kids even like him, although they were the ones who were taken so young that they barely even remember the life Mr. Dakin stole from them. We don't see the assassin very often. Mostly it's just his mother, who all the kids call Sammy D. She keeps the place clean and cooks for us. Not survival food either. Real, home, cooked meals. With favorites that our own mothers used to make. Sammy D gives us all chores too, but she works harder than anyone. She even splits the kids up by age and spends an hour a day with each group to homeschool us and assign reading. It's not nearly enough to forgive them, but I haven't tried to run away either. I don't know where else I would go, and besides, the other kids were quick to tell me what would happen if I did. We've had two runners this year, Alexa told me the first night after steering me to my bed in the dormitory. She's a late teen, a few years older than me with tight blonde braids and sharp, humorless features. They're buried out back, next to Spangles cat we used to have. No kids and no witnesses. I guess Mr. Dankin has two rules, and the second is more important than the first. Doesn't anyone try to fight back? I asked. I did. I almost got Sammy D too, a younger boy around 12 said from his adjacent bed. I had a kitchen knife and hid behind the door. She knew you were there the whole time. Another boy, probably the older brother, considering they both sported the same mass of unruly brown hair. She just wanted to test you. It wasn't a test, the first insisted. If you'd grabbed her legs, we could have got her. Did you get punished? I asked. They looked at each other and shrugged. If it was Mr. Dankin, we would be dead. Sammy D just took the knife away, the younger brother admitted, and showed us a different grip chimed in the other. Said we were wasting our body weight by slashing upward when we didn't have to. They both began to mime a controlled slashing motion in the air. That's Simon and Greg. Simon's the younger one, but they're both idiots, Alexa said. Don't listen to them. Fighting is only going to make it worse for you. The comfortable routine may have been enough to distract us during the day, but the nights were harder. The darkness would blur the unfamiliar room into ghastly, shuddering specters. The heavy silence did nothing to distract each of us from reliving our private nightmares. And I grew accustomed to falling asleep listening to the muffled sobs of those who couldn't drown out the sound with their pillow. I almost wished we were treated worse, that we were beaten or forced to work to destroy this facade of a family that Sammy D tried to shove down our throats. I didn't want to wait so long that I became indoctrinated into complacency like the others, though. So I knew I had to act. I tried rat poison the first time. I mixed it in the brownie batter to disguise the taste and warned all the other kids so they'd stay away from it. Sammy D figured it out somehow, though. She threw away the whole batch before Mr. Dakin even came home. All she said was, You better think hard about who your friends are before you try something like that again. Try something like that again. It wasn't a warning, it was an invitation. I didn't sleep much the next few nights. I found a vent which opened into the AC ducts, but Simon was the only one small enough to climb around. I kept watch for Sammy D while Simon explored until he found the place directly above the kitchen. There was a heavy iron light fixture that I thought we could drop on someone but it was screwed into place so tight that Simon couldn't find a way to budge it. I think I heard a wild animal skittering around the crawl space last night, Sammy D said the next morning while laying out plates of scrambled eggs. Yeah, I guess, I said. No one looked up from their plates. I just hope he's smart enough not to be crawling around when my son is here. She added innocently, we're running out of space in the backyard. Nobody had anything to say to that. Not until that night when we all started arguing. That's mine. Give it back, Greg was saying. 
You're just going to get yourself killed. Alexa dodged away from Greg's lunges. Mind your own business. Alexa sighed and dropped a heavy object wrapped in wires on the floor, an electric screwdriver and an extension cord. Where'd you get that? I asked. Sammy D must have left it here, Greg said. Simon was already unrolling the cable to measure out how long it would stretch. If she knows, then Mr. Dinkin knows, Alexa snapped. It's just another test, and you're going to get killed if you try something. She never told Mr. Dinkin about the rat poison, I said. Or if she did, he didn't do anything about it. Well, if she doesn't tell him, then I... Alexa caught herself mid-sentence. Simon and Greg were so busy with the drill that they didn't seem to notice. Alexa caught me staring, though, and she dragged me aside to whisper in my ear, I can't reason with them, but I need you on my side. If we don't warn Mr. Dankin, then he's going to. Not if he's dead. You can't be serious about this. After everything they've done for us? Alexa coughed and looked away. She must have become aware that the brothers were staring. As she was pulling back, she muttered, He's going to know, and you're going to be sorry. This wasn't the first time someone tried to kill Mr. Dankin or his mother, but they always seemed to know about it beforehand. It wasn't Sammy D who was telling him, though. If anything, she seemed to be helping us. It was Alexa. She was the one foiling the plans. And if any of us were ever going to get out of here, then we'd have to account for that. Alexa was standing in the driveway waiting for Mr. Dankin when he got home. I couldn't hear what she said to him, but I saw the smile wrinkle up his pudgy face like an old pumpkin. The glimmer of a razor blade appeared in his hand. I don't think any of us are going to get a second chance. Sammy D was waiting in the doorway. She helped him with his coat and tried to steer him toward his recliner in the living room, but he had only one thing in mind. He wordlessly stalked around the perimeter of the kitchen, carefully eyeing the iron light fixture from all angles. The whole while he paced, he kept playing with the razor in his hand, letting the light sparkle for everyone to see while it danced through his fingers. Where is Simon? He asked at last. No one replied but I caught Alexa glance up at the ceiling. Mr. Dinkin must have noticed it too. His eyes twinkled. Don't bother coming out, Simon. The hunt is my favorite part, he called. Be careful, it's going to fall, Alexa said. Don't worry, we'll take the light down, Greg said, winking at Alexa's confusion. I helped Greg carry a chair in from the living room that he could stand on. What are you doing? When he catches Simon, Alexa hissed. Shh, I muttered. Greg was already climbing onto the chair. Mr. Dankin was still fixated on the light fixture, chuckling to himself. Now, I shouted, flinging myself at Mr. Dankin to pin his arms. Simon exploded from his concealment in one of the kitchen cupboards to latch onto the man's legs. Behind you, Alexa screamed, but it didn't matter anymore. Greg had already launched himself from the chair, using the extra elevation in his body weight to drive a knife deep into the man's back with vicious force. I latched on even tighter as the blood started flowing over me, our combined weight forcing the man to the ground. For a second, his hand holding the razor blade broke free, but it twisted into a feeble claw as the thrusting knife drained the last of his strength. It only took a few seconds before the rest of the children joined in, Stomping, kicking, scratching, biting, all piling on top of the man who killed their parents, tearing him to pieces like a hundred years of decay condensed into a second. What about Sammy D? Alexa was screaming. Who do you think gave him the knife? Sammy D asked, leaning in the doorway. But he's your son! Alexa wailed. He's my assassin, she corrected. Mr. Dankin wasn't moving anymore. One by one, the kids pulled themselves off the body, some giving a few more swift kicks as they parted. But I only lost one assassin, Sammy D said, and look how many new ones I have now. We were all frozen in place, 
trying to read all the other blank faces in the room. Sammy D. fished inside her purse and pulled out several large wads of cash wrapped neatly in rubber bands. Twenty thousand dollars, because he was dangerous. That was your first job, she said. You have a family here, after all. A home. A way to make money and even help people if you choose the right targets. The first one is the hardest, but after that it's just practice. I want all of you to clean this mess up and wash up before dinner. Training begins for real tomorrow. She left the cash on the ground, but none of us followed her. The thrill of the kill was still hot in our blood. Could I do it again? Almost definitely. From this day on, I was a killer no matter what else I did besides. No kids though. You've got to draw the line somewhere. Sammy D taught us that there are three distinct ways to kill someone. The first is a murder of opportunity. The victim is alone on a dark night, or is blackout drunk, or some other circumstantial convenience which makes it the right time to act. Then there is the assassination, the calculated and premeditated kill which we will be training for. Finally, there is the murder of passion. When the blood boils too hot and we allow rage or hatred to force our hand, this is the most risky way to kill someone, both physically in the moment and regarding future forensic investigations, and it is strictly forbidden to us. I don't think there exists a term to describe exactly how Mr. Dankin died. The premeditation was inherent, as was the opportunity of his distraction, but neither compares with the utter brutality of his execution. I noticed when we were burying the body that the knife wounds in his back were surprisingly superficial. I think it was the shock, more than anything, which toppled him over. The actual cause of death? The lacerations of a dozen children skinning him alive with fists, nails, teeth, kitchen utensils, and anything else we could get our hands on. And of all of us who shredded him like a pack of wild dogs, none did so with more ferociousness, more glee, or more hunger than a small boy named Maker. I'd barely even noticed Maker during my first few days at the house. He was only 10 years old, seeming even younger because of his diminutive, almost emaciated frame. He never spoke without prompting, and his rare answers would be muttered with the volume and assurance of a self-conscious mouse. I hadn't counted on his help during the actual killing, but the moment Mr. Dakin had dropped to the ground, Maker had transformed into something new altogether. Even long after the man was dead, it took three of us to pry open the Maker's jaw from around the assassin's throat and drag the boy into the living room so he wouldn't disturb the burial. Hope I'm not paired up with that little demon, Greg had said during our first physical training session. I swear, he just licked his lips when Sammy D was talking about safe words. Shut up, you have no idea what he must have gone through to act like that, Alexa scolded him. What are you even doing here? Greg shot back. I figured. You'd be ratting us all out to the police by now. I nudged Greg hard. Sammy D was waiting for us to be quiet with her arms crossed. She may look like a babushka with her short gray hair tied back in a handkerchief, but she made disarming and pinning someone look like a ballet. Sammy D let the silence drag out for a few more excruciating seconds before she turned back to the chalkboard with its grotesquely detailed drawing of the human anatomy. Trust me, if I had somewhere else to go, I'd be there. Alexa couldn't resist whispering back. Bullshit, Greg mumbled. Weren't your parents hotshot musicians or something? You're probably loaded. Alexa didn't need to answer. The angle of her glare from under her brow spoke volumes. Greg and Simon. Sammy D barked. You're up first. Let's see those stances. We didn't get to the actual combat training until after dinner. 
Sammy D says that if your victim is fighting back, then you've already failed. Her teachings focused more on concealment, tracking, the preparation of poisons, and accuracy with projectiles. As long as she was teaching the theoretical stuff, it just felt like the coolest class I've ever taken in my life. The illusion couldn't last, though. Once the fighting started, it was impossible to ignore the deadly purpose that we were approaching every day. I was paired off against Maker. I asked to switch, since he's over five years younger than me. But Sammy D just said, the most difficult blows to strike are against those weaker than us. I think she was just placating my ego though, because there was nothing weak about going up against Maker. How am I supposed to hit him? He's not even in the right stance, I protested. Then teach him why he's wrong, she said. But what if he goes psycho and makes up all his own stuff? Then he'll teach you why you're wrong. Maker didn't exactly jump at me. Jumping would imply pushing off from something, and I'm not positive his feet never touched the ground. Before I knew what was happening, he was crawling all over me, raking my face with his fingers, grabbing my hair, digging his knee into my back. I don't understand how Sammy D thought this was okay. She talked a big game about calculating approaches and precise controlled motions, but she just stared and smiled while that wild thing pummeled me from all sides. The safe word? Completely ignored. One of his nails dug a deep trench above my eye and I couldn't see a thing through the blood. I tried just protecting my face with my arms, but he was relentless. He had lots of openings, but I couldn't let my guard down for a moment without getting absolutely savaged. When I'd finally had enough, I just ran through the hail of blows to tackle him to the ground. I straddled him with my superior body weight and pinned him tight, and that should have been the end of it. This is your chance to teach him, Sammy D shouted. I give, I give, Maker wailed, struggling feverishly against my grip. I started to stand, but powerful hands clamped onto my shoulders and pushed me back down on top of the boy. He's not going to learn like that. Hurt him bad. What? I'm not going to... The vice of Sammy D's hands closed. You let him just walk away from this, and he's going to think it's okay to lose. That's not how this game is played. You lose once in the real world, and you're dead. Now make him feel it. The blood was flowing freely into my eyes and the whole world had gone red. My face was on fire from a dozen scratches that greedily drank in the blood. Do it now, Sammy D shouted in my ear. Maker clenched his eyes shut underneath me, his face tormented into a mask of sheer terror. I wanted to slam my fist into the little bastard's mouth so hard that all those sharp teeth rained down his throat. I wanted to hurt him so bad my whole body was an ocean of pressure begging release. Maker wasn't a criminal mastermind or a killer though. He was a frightened little boy who only knew one way to survive. And overflowing with how badly I wanted to hurt him just because I could, that scared the shit out of me. I slapped Sammy D's hands away and scrambled off of Maker. Everyone in the yard was staring at me. I turned a slow circle, then looked down at the boy on the ground. His eyes were still shut and he was trembling all over. I don't know how much of the blood was mine and how much was his. Then, at Sammy D, her hands and her hips scowling at me like she'd just caught me breaking a promise to her. This isn't who I am. This isn't who any of these kids are, but it's what they'll become if they stay. I turned and ran, half expecting a bullet or a tripwire or something to spin me to the ground before I'd taken a dozen steps. Not a word or sound behind me, not even the footfalls of a pursuer. I was free. I waited about 10 minutes to catch my breath and let my head clear. 
Then I circled around to the front of the house. I heard the shouts from the other people still in the yard, so I guess the rest of them were still training. I slipped up to the dormitory to take my share of the $20,000 I had stuffed under my mattress. That's all I needed to start a new life. I sure as hell didn't need this. She gave us our first mission. I practically jumped out of my skin at the voice. It was Alexa, sitting on her bed in the dark. I ignored her and moved to retrieve my money. Maker took it. He volunteered, Alexa added. You can just leave with me, I said. Alexa shook her head. I volunteered too. Why? Because Maker's staying, and I have to keep my little brother safe. That little monster is, I know how he gets when there's a fight. I kept trying to avoid fights with Mr. Dankin because I knew Maker would go crazy and get himself killed, but I promise it's not his fault. He's only like that because, I don't care, I shouted. I had my money and wasn't going to waste any more time here. I'm never coming back, and I'm never going to see any of you again. Yes, you will, she called after me. Our first mission is you. You haven't felt alive before you've killed someone. The symphony in your nerves in that moment will drown out every thrill you've ever had. I've never seen a color brighter than Mr. Dankin's blood, nor heard a sound truer than the death rattle rasping from his final breath. And if I go the rest of my life wading through a sea of muted colors, I will accept it gracefully because I know I have tasted of the forbidden fruit and hate myself for how sweet the juices ran. I didn't waste time plotting counterattacks or defensive measures. I stashed my money in a shallow hole and ran the whole four miles to the nearest police station. The blood had stopped running from the gash above my eye, but no one needed to look twice at me to know I've been through hell. We're going to send a squad car with two officers to investigate the premises, the man in the station told me. Do you feel comfortable going with them to show where the bodies are buried? Of course I wasn't comfortable, but neither would I be okay sitting at the station and letting two men go unprepared into that den of evil. Two won't be enough, I said. You'll be walking into a war. We have no intentions on fighting anyone. We're just going to take a look around and we can always call for a backup if anything doesn't feel right, Sergeant Sinclair said. He had enough gray hair around his temples to know better, but he talked with a rigid arrogance that left no room for debate. Sinclair and Deputy Erickson escorted me to their cruiser and told me to sit in the back and I allowed them to take charge. One way or another, this would all be over soon. I hadn't wanted to sabotage my own credibility by telling them the assassins were children. I'd only said that I knew who killed my parents, knew where the orders were coming from, and knew where at least three bodies were buried. I didn't work up the courage to tell them more until we were already parked outside Sammy D's house. She brainwashes people. I splurted without context. She kidnaps children and she brainwashes them to fight for her. You can't let your guard down, not for a second, not with anyone. Stay in the car until we come back. You'll be perfectly safe, Sergeant Sinclair said. I nodded rigidly, my face pressed against the window, straining to get a glimpse of what might be in store for them. Maybe Sammy D just took her money and ran for it. She must have some contingency plan in case she was discovered, right? She couldn't intend to take on the whole town. The officers were about a dozen feet from the park cruiser when Maker appeared around the side of the house. He was limping in an exaggerated motion, his face and body further smeared with blood and bits of gore. He was crying and wailing for help, but the moment the police started advancing, Maker turned and began staggering in the opposite direction. It was so real it made me sick at least until Maker skipped a step, accidentally limping on the wrong leg. 
but I don't think either of the cops noticed. Don't follow him. It's a trap, I shouted through the glass. Stay in the car, Sinclair barked without turning. Erickson had already disappeared around the corner after Maker. Then came a shrill scream from the yard on the other side of the house, and a moment later, Sinclair was gone too. Just me, pressed against the glass and wondering if it was already too late to run again. Then another face, an inch from mine, peering through the window at me. Alexa knocked sharply and said, Hey, can you hear me? She must have been kneeling beside the car because her body was obscured behind the door. I couldn't tell if she was carrying a weapon. I triple checked that all the doors were locked before I replied. It's over, Alexa. Turn yourself in or run. You don't need to go down with these people. You still don't understand, do you? She asked. The sincerity in her voice and the pleading furrows in her smooth skin were disarming. Sammy D is going to take care of us forever. She loves us. Like she loved her own son. There was a gunshot from the yard. I jolted so bad that I hit my head on the ceiling. Alexa didn't even react. Like everything was so perfect before, Alexa said, her voice still gentle and coaxing. Do you know what would have happened to Maker if Sammy D hadn't saved him? Saved? I couldn't believe my ears. Why was there only one gunshot? What the hell was going on over there? We'd go weeks at a time without even seeing our parents, she continued. Sometimes they'd remember to hire someone to take care of us. Sometimes it was just me and Maker. Even when they were home, we weren't allowed to leave our room when they were partying out there. And with the meth, that could go on sometimes for days at a time. A second gunshot. A third immediately afterward. That wasn't a warning. That was an execution. Do you have any idea what it's like to hold your little brother and wait for him to stop shaking? Only he wouldn't stop because of the chemicals going through his veins. But I couldn't understand that. I thought he was just scared and that it was my fault I couldn't get him to feel safe. Two more gunshots in rapid succession. I could imagine Sammy D kicking over the second officer's slumped corpse so clearly that I might as well be staring at it. Maybe it wasn't like that for you, but someone must have wanted your parents dead for a reason. Ever think about what they were hiding that made this happen? Ever wonder if they deserved it? Everyone out there deserves to die. Everyone but us. Sammy D wants to give you another chance to join the family. I couldn't stand it any longer. I had to see what was going on. If the police were dead, then staying here wouldn't protect me anyway. Alexa stepped back as I slowly opened the door. It was impossible not to notice the razor blade clutched between her fingers. What's it going to be? Sammy D was walking around the house, a handgun casually hanging from her fingers. That was it then. It was over. Alexa grinned moving to stand in solidarity beside the old woman. We're leaving here within the hour, Sammy D added. You're coming with us, or you're staying here. Doesn't matter to me, either way. Sammy D's finger twitched around the trigger. She might pretend to be relaxed, but I could see the tension which twisted her fingers into a claw around the gun. I didn't have any delusion that staying here meant anything other than then buried in the backyard. What's the matter? Her voice was a gravel avalanche. Too scared to answer? I shook my head. You taught me better than that. Half a smirk played about her lips before they drew back into a tight line. Alexa was still smiling. You taught us all better than that. Except for Maker, right? You never seemed to care that he was out of control. Alexa's smile flirted with a snarl. I couldn't understand why, but I see it now, I said. You never thought he had what it took to become an assassin, did you? 
You never even bothered to show him how to defend himself, because you only ever planned on using him once. The front door opened, and I could see the rest of the children huddled inside. They were laden down with duffel bags and suitcases, ready to go wherever they were told. You're better than that, though, Sammy D said. I'm not going to throw you away. I'm going to take care of you. Alexa's eyes flashed across the children. She ran back to peer around the side of the house. I could practically see the gears in her head turning beneath the frantic lashing of her braided hair. Two gunshots for each of the two cops. Where did the first shot go? Sammy D. No, Alexa started, her words dying in her mouth. Your brother was a hero, Alexa, Sammy D. cooed. We all owe our lives to him. I caught the eye of Greg and Simon inside the house. I didn't miss the curt nod. I didn't underestimate the light burning in Alexa's eyes. None of us needed so much as a word to know what had to happen next. Sammy D felt it too. Her gun was leveled in a flash. One bullet escaped the muzzle, but I was already behind the armored door of the police cruiser. She never got a second chance. Children were pouring out of the house leaping on the old woman and dragging her to the ground. The flash as Alexa's razor traced a line in the air like a spear of light. It wasn't the death rattle or the color of blood which filled the air though. There was no sound so haunting as the pitiful howl which ripped itself from somewhere deep inside of Alexa. There was no color like the fire in her eyes being tempered by the rush of her swelling tears. The thrill of the kill was still hanging in the air, but one look around was enough to know that it was nothing compared to the burden of loss. We had money and a chance at a new life together. The most important thing we gained from the Assassin's Orphanage is knowing you can't buy yourself a new life at the price of someone else's. Life can't be bought or sold or stolen in any form. It can only be built, and it's a whole lot easier to build when you have a real family like I have now. Do you know what it's like to live without a soul? Because I do. It's like watching a romantic movie that's so perfect, you find yourself falling in love with the character. Then the lights come on, and you suddenly remember that person didn't exist. And even if they did, they would never care that you exist. It's like running the wrong way on a racetrack. It doesn't matter whether you ever finish or not, because everyone else has already crossed the line and gone home. You've run further than anyone else. Your legs are in agony, and there's a fire in your lungs. But you're still running, because you're afraid of the silence when you finally stop. Living without a soul is sitting in the eye of the hurricane. Life is moving all around you. And sometimes, it feels like you're part of it, when it passes too close. But in the end, nothing, and no one, can even move you. And though the wind howls fierce in its savage glory, and sweeps all the world from under your feet, you'll never know what it feels like to join that wild dance. And that's okay. You tell yourself that, at least, you won't be hurt like all those other fragile humans, burdened with their souls. But, deep down, you wish that you could feel that hurt, just for a moment. Just so, once in your life, you knew there was something important enough to be hurt over. I lost my soul while I was only six years old. My father didn't want me. My mother told me so. She said I was the reason that he left. 
and I believed her. I was in first grade at the time, and our class project was to make a paper lantern which was closed at the top. The hot air from the candle was supposed to lift the lantern, although mine wasn't sealed properly and couldn't leave the ground. I was getting really frustrated, and after the fourth or fifth attempt, I got so mad that I actually ripped the whole thing to shreds. My teacher, Mr. Hansbury, a gentle dumpling of a man with a bristly moustache, squatted down next to me and gave me the lantern he had been building. I was so mad that I was about to destroy that one too. But he sat me down and said, Do you know what I love most about paper lanterns? They might seem flimsy, but when they fly, they can carry away anything that you don't want anymore. You can put all your anger into one of these, and the moment you light that candle, it's going to float away and take your anger with it. That sounded pretty amazing to me at the time. I settled down to watch him glue the candle into place, concentrating all my little heart on filling the lantern with my bad feelings. It started off with just the anger at the project, but one bitterness led to the next, and by the time Mr. Hansbury was finished, I'd poured everything that I was into the paper. All the other class lanterns only hovered a few feet off the ground, but mine went up and up and on forever, all the way to the top of the sky. The other kids laughed and cheered to see it go, and my teacher put his hand on my shoulder and looked so proud. But I didn't feel much of it. How could I? With my soul slowly disappearing from view. I remember asking Mr. Hansbury if I could go home and live with him after that, but he said he didn't think my mother would like that. I told him that she would, but he still said no. I didn't suppose it would have mattered one way or another though, because it was too late to take back what I did. There's something else besides the numbness that comes when your soul is gone. I didn't see them the first night, but I could hear them breathing when I lay down to sleep. Soft as the wind but regular and calm like a sleeping animal. I sat and listened in the darkness for a long while, covers clutched over my head. The breathing seemed so close, I could feel its warmth billowing under the sheets. I cried for what seemed like hours, but Mum didn't come up, and I was too afraid to get out of bed. I don't think I fell asleep, until it was light outside. Mum was angry at me in the morning for keeping her awake. She heard me, but she thought I would give up eventually. I didn't get breakfast that day, and I didn't mention the breathing again. That was only the beginning. I think a soul does more than help you appreciate the things around you. It also protects you from noticing the things you aren't supposed to see. And with it gone, they were everywhere. Beady eyes glinting from under the sofa, a dark flash at the corner of my eye, scuffling in the drawers, and late night knockings on the door and windows. I never got a good look at them, but they were always watching me. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and feel their weight all over my body, pinning me down. Rough skin against me, dirty fingers digging into my nose and mouth. Worse still, their touch penetrated my mind, inserting thoughts so vile that I knew they couldn't be my own. Although the longer they were in my head, 
the more difficult it was to be certain of that. Did I want to insert a needle into my eye and see how far it would go? Probably not. Then why could I not stop thinking about it? Were they making me think about beating my classmates into bloody pulps, or setting fire to people's homes to watch them weep on the sidewalk? Or was that all from me? The first few nights I lie awake and cried myself, but I soon learnt to be more afraid of my mother than I was of the creatures. As much as I hated the shadows, they never hit me after all. I wouldn't call it living, but I continued to exist for years like that. During the day, I kept to myself, exhausted and numb. All colours seemed muted, except for the glittering eyes which tracked me from unlikely crevices, all around muffled for their scrapings and breathings. The only time I would really feel was when I would lie awake in the darkness. But these were the times I wish I felt less. Neither screams nor silence brought any comfort from the intrusive probings, and my mind was flooded with persistent images of violence, self-destruction and despair. Over time, I found a trick to help me get through the insufferable nights. I convinced myself that my body was not my own, and that nothing it felt could do me harm. The real me was lying safe somewhere, high up in the sky inside a paper lantern. No matter what my flesh did to anyone else, that had nothing to do with me. I kept everything below the surface as best I could, until I was 14 years old. By then, I'd lost the ability to distinguish the origins of my thoughts. All I knew is that I wanted to hurt someone. Hurt them as badly as I wanted to be hurt in return. I picked fights at school, I pushed my classmates around, and they stayed cleared of me. I once drove a pencil into someone's hand where they weren't looking, grinding it back and forth to make sure the tip broke off inside the skin. I heard the creatures sniggering at that, but it was a disdained kind of laugh. When I was called into the principal's office afterwards, I was surprised to see Mr. Hansbury there too. The principal was all rage lecturing me about stamping around like the Spanish Inquisition. Mr. Hansbury didn't say much. He just looked tired and sad. He didn't speak up until the principal dismissed me, at which point he put his hand on my shoulder and leaned in real close to ask, Have you looked for it? I didn't have the faintest idea what he meant. I gave him a stare that a marble statue would find cold. Your lantern, did you ever try to get it back? I told him to piss off. I'm sorry for telling you to send it away, he said, gripping my shoulder to stop me from leaving. I thought it would be easier than facing, but I was wrong. People can't hide from themselves like that. The pencil was good, but it wasn't enough. My thoughts matched the sardonic tone of the laughter, mocking me for my pitiful attempts. As the creatures crawled over me at night, and their intentions mingled with my own. I decided to bring a knife next time. I considered a gun too, but resolved that it wasn't personal enough. I'd rather look a person in the eyes when the blades slip them, than shoot a dozen scurrying figures from a distance. And what happened to me afterwards? It didn't matter, because the real me was safely floating in a breeze a thousand miles away. It wasn't going to be at school this time. I wanted to take my time and not be interrupted. Instead, I went out at midnight, the taste of those dirty fingers still fresh in my mouth. I didn't care who my victim was, 
as long as they could feel what I was doing to them. My neighbourhood was quiet at night, and there weren't a lot of options though, so I decided to head down to the 24-hour gas station on the corner. The kitchen knife gripped between my fingers, cold air filling my lungs, groaning laughter and applause from the creatures thick around me in the darkness. I almost felt alive there for a second, just like I did with the pencil. But this would taste better. Holding the knife, I felt like a virgin on prob night, with my crush slowly unzipping my pants. I wasn't in the eye of the storm anymore. I was the storm. And tonight would be the night that I saw the paper lantern floating in the air. Just a few feet off the ground. The shell was so filthy and stained that I could barely see the light inside. It was impossible for the fragile thing to have survived all these years. More impossible still for the single candle to have burned all this time. But I knew without a doubt that it was my light by the way the creatures howled. They hated it with a passion, and would have torn it to shreds if I had not gotten there first. I plucked the lantern from the air and guided it softly to the ground, the shades screeching as they whirled around me. Feral animals cowed by the miraculous flame. Holding the lantern close, I found the note that was attached. I found this in the woods. Took a couple of days to find it. Mr. H. I collapsed on the sidewalk, trembling for all the time I'd spent away from myself, blubbering and sobering like an idiot until the flame guttered out from my tears. The howling creatures reached a feverish point, and then there was silence, all rising together into the sky with the last wisps of curling smoke from the lantern. It hurt like nothing I'd felt in years. But it was a cleansing kind of hurt. I didn't hide from it. I didn't send it away. I didn't drown it with distractions or fight its grip on me. I won't go so far as to say that pain is a good thing. But it is undeniably a real thing. And I'd rather hurt than send it away to live with the hole it leaves behind. I just wanted to get home that night. An impromptu board meeting ran late, and I had to stay until almost 9pm just to take notes. When I finally did get out of there, waiting for the elevator was absolute torture. My heels were killing me, my bra was a dagger in my back, and all I had to show for my hard work was a legal pad full of insane political drivel and off-coloured jokes. Five, ten minutes before the door opened, inside a pair of giggling teenagers were shoving each other back and forth. One girl, one boy. Baggy hoodies, ripped jeans. They smell as though marijuana was a perfume. It didn't take a legal secretary to guess they had been playing an elevator game by pushing every button. I thought about reprimanding them, but the moment I stepped inside they went dead quiet. Maybe they knew they were busted. The building should have been on lockdown by now anyway. I don't even know how they even got in here, but as my energy was so depleted, I didn't really care. Where are you going? I asked just to be polite. The boy started to giggle again for a second, then stopped. So abruptly, I almost thought I was imagining it. It looked like the girl was holding her breath. She hid her face beneath her hair and went to push floor one. Not my kids, not my problem. What was my problem is the elevator was going up instead of down. I moved towards the row of buttons and the girl fell flat on the floor and scrambled out the way like I was made of lava. I mashed the highlighted number one. 
but we were going up quicker than ever, faster than it had ever gone before. There was nothing to hold on to, but I had to press myself to the back of the wall from falling over. It was shaking now too, buckling back and forth as it screeched up the cable. The lights flickered, and a cold wind started to whistle through the cracks in the doors. It wasn't like a storm or anything though, it was more like all of the heat in the elevator was flooding out into the shaft. Another lurch, the hardest one yet. I fell straight on my ass. The kids playing the elevator game were holding on to each other and managed to remain standing. But even after we'd stopped, they kept clinging on as though holding on for dear life. The number one button went dark and number 10 turned on. Slowly, ponderously, as though it were struggling against a near insurmountable pressure, the door slid open. I started to stand, then slipped again as one of my heels snapped clean off. I took the other shoe off, so frustrated that I just threw it at the kids. Now look what you've done, you've broken the bloody elevator. The boy glanced in my direction, but immediately turned away again. They were straining to look outside, but terrified to get close to me. Good, they should be scared. Vandalizing a legal office was a stupid thing to do, as stupid as picking a fight in a police station. I want your names, your IDs, both of you, I snapped. You will be held responsible for any damages incurred, as far as the trespassing is concerned. But they still wouldn't look at me. The boy grabbed the girl by the hand and darted out the hallway. I couldn't just let them run havoc. Hey you! You can't go in there! I had to run to keep up now. That's Mr. Bogle's office, you aren't allowed to! Of course, I patted myself down for my cell phone but it wasn't there. I must have dropped it when I fell in the elevator. I half turned back, but the door was already closing. I took a step in the direction, but then I heard something crash from the office. I spun again, sprinting down the hallway in my bare feet. The boy was sitting on Mr. Bogle's desk, while the girl stared out the window. Look at the sky, she said, and how tall the buildings are. Dude, this is crazy, he replied. Either they were stoned out of their minds, or it wasn't just marijuana. They were running their hands over everything, so I wouldn't have been surprised if they were rolling too. The boy was even poking the potted plant, like it was some alien creature he had never seen before. That's enough, I roared. Finally, they both looked at me, and at each other, and then back at me. Did they regret playing this stupid elevator game yet? Let's get out of here. The boy rammed straight through me with his shoulder, sending me spinning back to the ground. The girl was trying to jump over me now, but I managed to grab her by the ankle and drag her down. She thrashed melodramatically on the ground for a few seconds, but before I could get to my feet, she planted a kick in my face and broke free. The door was already closing by the time I got to my feet, and they were both inside, staring at me with wide trembling eyes as though they were somehow the victim in all of this. I felt absolutely feral as I lunged at them. I managed to get my fingers in the cracks before the elevator closed, and the sensor reflected the door was open wide. Half a dozen buttons had already been pushed, glowing like one big middle finger. The final stage of the elevator game had been played. They were cowering in the corner as I loomed over them, an inferno of retribution burning in my eyes. Fine, let the elevator take the long trip down. That was just longer for them to be trapped in there with me. Now they couldn't run. The struggle was absolutely pitiful. The boy's throat was almost comically fragile, and I was amazed how little pressure I needed to ram my broken heel through it. The girl was almost gone by the time I got to her, 
withering to a husk in seconds after the venom from my nails coursed through her legs where I had grabbed her. I got out of the elevator at the bottom, straightening my dress. I found my phone again and fixed my hair after snapping the other heel off my shoe. I was able to look almost presentable again. I thought I could finally go home after all of that, but it didn't take long to realise that I'd never been further from home in my life. What strange green plants they have here. The dark blue sky was nothing like the purple and orange we have at home. No wonder they were so surprised by everything in my world. If everyone here is so fragile as these two little ones, then I think I'm going to have a lot of fun here. I am at least 15 feet from the frozen shore when I hear it. The ice feels as solid as concrete, so I take another step. The Winnebago Shishish is like most of the Minnesota ice out lakes, which will remain frozen until spring. There's no chance of breaking through. At least, that's what my girlfriend Amy keeps telling me. There's a knock. I hear it cracking. We shouldn't go so far out. I hear something cracking. Is it the voice of my terrified boyfriend? I glare at her, or at least at the wandering bundle of winter coats which has devoured her without a trace. Somewhere in my head is faintly echoing the song, I will do anything for love, but I won't do that. I can't turn it off, but I do my best to turn down the volume so I can take another step. The thick blanket of snow which covers the ice keeps me from sliding, and if I really concentrate, I can pretend I'm walking on a regular snowy field. Knock. It's just so hard, with that sound like an ephemeral gunshot deep below the ice. Reverberating echoes insidiously linger, somewhere between hearing and imagination. There isn't any reason to be afraid, but I'm trembling. It's just because it's 14 degrees outside. If you don't hurry up, I'm going to start stomping and throwing rocks, Amy shouts. Then we'll see how solid it really is. When did she get so far ahead of me? It's amazing how quickly the world can pass you by when you're staring at your feet. I scramble and slide another few shambling paces towards her. It's easier to move if I just focus on her. Don't look down. Don't look down. Don't look... And that is when I hear another knock from under the ice. I look down. My body doesn't ask for permission first. I couldn't help it. When the sound comes from directly below me, I stare down into the blank patch of ice where the snow is thinner. I stare down into the blurred blue tinged face on the other side and the hand which pulls back. But the knock doesn't come. This time, the hand simply presses against the underside of the glassy window. Fingers spread wide in an intimate gesture, as though inviting my touch from the other side. Seriously, dude? I'm going to freeze to death waiting for you. Amy? My voice is muffled from my scarf, but I can't look up from the lake. The face is coming into focus as it presses itself against the ice. Amy's skin had never been so pale. Her eyes never so blue as those staring up at me from below my feet. I swear to God, if you're going to pussy out on me, then I'm leaving your ass here. You said you'd go all the way out with me. Amy. The other Amy. Underneath the ice. Her mouth is moving too. It isn't hard to read her lips when it's only one word. Run. You've got five seconds before I leave you here. 
my girlfriend shouted. For my knees buckle, and I tremble down to peer into the ice. The other Amy isn't exactly identical. Her clothing is different, but familiar. She's wearing the purple sweater my girlfriend had been wearing yesterday when we'd gone out skiing together. Amy, wait! I put my hands against the ice to mirror the girl underneath. She recoils immediately, her face twisting into that of desperate fear. Amy and I had been separated for about an hour yesterday, when she moved onto the advanced slopes while I was practicing on the bunny hill. Had something happened to her during that time? Two! There was another knock her fist slamming into the underside of the ice, which vibrates underneath me, then slamming again. Her movements frenzied in their urgency, her mouth straining as the silent screams ripped from her body. The muscles in my legs coil beneath me, so tense they may as well be a brooding avalanche which needs only the weight of one more snowflake to begin. One the voice was different. It was still Amy, but it wasn't her, like comparing a black and white photo to the original. All the colour, all the life, all the flavour had been drained from the sound, leaving only the barest skeleton of her voice to hang in the frozen air. Run! screams the girl from under the ice, but I can't leave her there. I clasp my hands together to raise them above my head, smashing them into the window. It feels like the bones in my fingers are rattling together from the impact. Underneath, the girl is flinging her entire body against her side of the ice. I'm giving up on you, shouted the colourless voice. It sounded like it was further away, but I didn't look up. The girl below the ice is growing weaker with each stride. Her fingers are stiffing and inflexible. Her mouth is still working over the same word again and again, but each iteration comes more slowly as her jaw resists the effort. I can break through. A deep hollow crack is resonating with each blow. Flurries of snow and ice shrapnel explode in the air as I strike the ice again and again. The girl below is sinking now, but I'm not giving up until glacial waters spray from the crack. One more blow, and I'm through, plunging my hand into the numbing chill to seize the stiff fingers slipping deep into the water. The skin is so hard and cold, it feels like metal, but life surges into her as she responds to my touch. She's gripping me now, and if I can just get stable footing, I'll be able to haul her out. But she pulls before I have a chance, and I'm already tumbling into winter's gaping mouth. Water so cold that it burns my skin, closes over my head. The other Amy braces her feet against the underside of the ice to pull me deeper still, launching off with her legs to send both of us spiralling downwards. I can feel my eyes freezing all the way to my skull, but I can't shut them if I want any chance of finding the hole in the ice. She's still clinging to me, but a few wild kicks buy me enough space to start crawling my way back towards the surface. I expect my impetus to rocket me straight out the water, but my head only slams into the impenetrable ceiling of ice. Even down here, it sounds a lot like the knocking I've heard since I arrived. My wild finger probes the ice as far as I can reach in every direction. I went straight down and back up. The hole should be here. My skin rivets against the numbing darkness. The pressure in my lungs is mounting by the second. My body demands a scream, but I refuse to waste the last remnants of my precious air. I'm pulling myself along the bottom of the ice in every direction, but the strength in my fingers is swiftly fleeting. The hole is gone. The light is dying. And soon I will follow. Soon, but not yet. Fingers grip around my ankle. I'm not strong enough to kick free anymore, but another hand latches onto me and begins to drag me, and I know in my heart that it's the hand of death. Then the pull. Water rushes over me, but I can barely feel it anymore. 
There's a momentary pause as the hands refocus their grip and then pull again, dragging me deeper still. My last uncertain thought is wondering why it's growing brighter around me instead of darker. An idle curiosity of no consequence. She's pulling again, and at that moment, my legs are pierced by a sudden wind. My brain can no longer process how that's possible. Then another pull, and the water begins to pour off my body. My head is suddenly clear from the water, and I collapse onto my back on solid ground. I'm coughing and spitting up water, but a warm blanket is being wrapped around me. My eyes flutter open from the life-giving pressure, and Amy is there. Amy, in her purple sweater, perfectly dry. She's holding me to her and wailing incoherently. I must have passed out after that, but when I woke up, I was back inside her house. She said I must have been crazy to break the ice underneath me, but she ran back as soon as she saw me fall in. I was upside down in the water, but she managed to pull me out by my ankles. What on earth were you thinking? You could have died! I didn't tell her about the face under the ice though. I didn't ask her how she could have changed back to her purple sweatshirt in the middle of the ordeal. And above all else, I didn't ask her about the knocking, which I still hear resounding far above my head, almost as though it were coming from another world. I don't think I am ready to find out. You can feel Missy. Enter a room before you see her. The ambient sound of the college classroom dissolve when she speaks. All the racious shouting and laughter filled muffled besides the softly spoken melody of her voice. She wears light and shadow with equal grace. Every angle making her appear as though she were posing for the painter's canvas, from the depths of her eyes to the supple curve of her body. Missy was a walking captivation. She was a dream, and I her dreamer, but it was all too soon that I had to wake. She called me the night before she died. An event I've kept private until now, out of its sheer impossibility. She'd been absent from class a week before that, but now she spoke fast, rattling off a string of letters, demanding that I write down everything. I was scrambling to keep up, unable to ask questions. Twenty letters total, ranging from A to D. They want more from me than I can give, she explained in a breathy rush. I have to go now. Memorize it, okay? You'll understand when they take you. The line went dead, and I couldn't reach her again. She wasn't in class the next day. Our psychology professor announced that she met with a fatal accident, refusing any further details. No one else seemed to care, but each passing day, I felt the burning of her empty chair in front of me. All I could do was memorize the list she gave me, and wait, hating myself for not doing more to get to know her while I had the chance. Then came the test. Just think of it as a survey, Professor Russell said, distributing the papers. Do your best and don't worry. It won't affect your grade. It's just a little experiment for the department. The impossible test. Indecipherable characters. Enigmatic equations. Utter nonsense. Students were looking around and starting to laugh. Professor Russell smiled indulgently, just urging us to take our best guess. 
the only thing that seemed familiar was the Scantron answer key. 20 questions, 20 letters. Coincidence or not, I filled them in from memory. I could feel the professor's eyes lock on me as I wrote with purpose, but I didn't care. I was consumed with the mystery of Missy's disappearance, savouring this last connection before she faded from the world altogether. Tests were collected, but I could tell the only paper the professor was interested in was mine. His keen eyes kept flashing between my test and my face. Then he excused himself to go to the bathroom, fishing out his phone as he left. I took the opportunity to follow. I've got another one from my class. Professor Russell was talking on the phone, his back to me as he walked. Perfect score, just like Missy. I tried to get closer to hear the voice on the other end, but the professor heard me and turned around. Going somewhere? He asked, pressing the phone against his chest bathroom, I grunted, rushing ahead, feeling his eyes on me all the way down the hall. He was leaning against the wall, arms crossed, patiently waiting for when I got out. We need to talk, Elijah. His voice was flat and dark. How did Missy die? I hadn't meant to blurt it out, but there it was. It had been on the tip of my tongue for so long that I'm surprised I even lasted this long. The professor arched his eyebrows studying me. She isn't dead. Not exactly. I can take her to you if you want, but you might not like what you see. The professor wrote something on a notepad and handed it to me, midnight. Room 031. Pack a suitcase. The psychology building? I asked. I didn't know the rooms went below a hundred. He pressed a key into my hand before turning back towards the classroom. This will let you into the basement. Oh, and Elijah. He glanced back as he opened the door. You might want to make an appropriate excuse to your friends and family. They won't be seeing you again for a while. Missy and I were never close before the night she called me. Our relationship was little more than collaborating on the occasional assignment or exchanging a covert smile across the room. Is it possible to love someone when you don't know the first thing about them? Regardless, I was impotent against my overwhelming curiosity. Professor Russell's doubtlessly counted on that purposefully, withholding details to bait his hook. It seemed so obvious looking back, but at the time I couldn't think of anything besides the frantic desperation in Missy's voice. She needed me somehow, and that's all I needed to know. If only I had known what waited for me, then no compulsion, mortal or otherwise, could have made me step through that door. Instead, I was outside the room five minutes before midnight. I had called my family to let them know I was accepted into a foreign exchange program and that I might be out of touch until I got set up there. I felt the strangeness of the place the second I opened room 031. A descending stairway cut deeply into the ground. Steps and walls hewn from large uneven stones that would better be suited to a medieval castle than a university. I had to use my phone as a flashlight, laboriously struggling my suitcase behind me. The stairway terminated in what can only be described as a wall of flesh. Taunt skin so tight as to be almost transparent, stretched from wall to wall. 
the outline of faint blue veins was pulsing rhythmically beneath a single great eye. Almost a foot across was embedded the centre. It blinked at me as I approached. A small stool was placed in front, with a serrated knife resting on top. Another note with my professor's handwriting read, Continue until you can go no further. The door I entered at the top of the stairs slammed shut, and I jumped at the sound. I pushed the feeble flashlight of my phone as far up as the stairs as it would go, but it couldn't reach the top. If someone had entered behind me, then I wouldn't know. Hello? My voice cracked like it hadn't done since puberty. I picked up the knife and turned back to the wall of skin. The eye strained wider, staring at the blade in my hand. The whole wall began to violently tremble, goosebumps even appearing on the surface. I slowly set the knife back down, watching the wall visibly relax as I did so. Footsteps on the stairs. Hello? I tried again, stronger this time. Qu quiet, hissed a male voice from the darkness. We'll go further if they don't see us coming. Black eyes greedily caught my pale light. The boy who entered my illumination was about my age, probably no more than a college sophomore. Bumping along behind him came his own suitcase, considerably larger than my own. Did you pass too? What's going on? I asked. You should know if you read the test. We've been accepted to the MC Academy. MC? I stared in open confusion. Mortal Coil. A flash of sneer as he pushed past me. He grabbed the knife from the table, and I flinched. How do you not know this? We're going to demon school. You mean a school that teaches demons? Or a school that teaches... What are you, stupid? You couldn't have even read the paper if you didn't have demon blood in you. I opened my mouth to ask more, deciding instead to hold my tongue just in time. Somehow, it didn't seem wise to tell the condescending guy with a knife that I cheated my way through and didn't really belong here. You want to do it or should I? He asked, holding the knife handle towards me. The wall was shaking so badly now that I could feel a gentle wind wafting from its convulsions. The other student must have noticed that I was frozen with confusion because he pulled the knife back a moment later. Fine, but you get the next one. I'm not going to carry you the whole way. He spun and thrust the knife directly in the giant eye on the wall. It clenched shut, lurching and thrashing against him. He grunted and leaned the blade, pushing it even deeper, as blood flowed freely to drench him up to the arm. The flesh was rumbling like a man trying to scream through a mouth that was sewn shut. Five, maybe ten seconds before the trembling stopped, the boy withdrew the knife to make a few savage slashes until the flesh relinquished its hold on the walls and fell into a heaping mass on the floor. Guess this is mine now, he said, wiping off the dagger and storing it in his suitcase. He lifted his case a foot off the ground and stepped through the leaking monstrosity on the ground. You coming or not, he added. I nodded, but it was nothing more but a reflex. I tried not to look down as I gingerly stepped over the mess on the floor, almost vomiting as I felt it squelch beneath my feet. What have I gotten myself into? He introduced himself as Michael Suland as we continued. Not the company I would have chosen, but he at least seemed to know what he was doing. 
I was careful not to ask anything that would betray my ignorance after that, but I was able to pick up a few clues from his idle conversation. Michael didn't know he had demon blood until recently, but he'd suspected there was something different about him since birth. He accidentally watched the original Saw movie when he was eight, and his parents only caught him when they heard how loudly he was laughing. He'd broken his arm skateboarding so badly once that the bone ruptured from his skin, and he spent an hour playing with it before going to the hospital. He even said he felt like he was nocturnal sometimes, describing the night as something which fit him as naturally as second skin. The shrill wailing of an infant broke the conversation. We exchanged glances, his face a mask of greedy excitement, like a child in the candy shop. When we stopped next, there was a closed door blocking the hallway wooden this time, at least, although that did nothing to distract from the crying infant placed upon the matching wooden table. He couldn't be more than two months old. I picked him up, trying to get him to stop crying. Michael was reading the note. The key is inside. Inside what? I asked. He just smiled. I'm not going to do that. My response was visceral and immediate. This is sick. The first note just said to go as far as we were able. That means we can stop whenever we want. That means it's a test, Michael corrected, stooping to open his case. He glanced at the dark hallway behind me. I could leave. I could close the door and pretend none of this ever happened. I turned back to see Michael producing the serrated knife, still wet with blood. Leaving wouldn't stop these tragedies though. I would only enable the school to continue training these monsters. Doubtlessly, preparing them for the worst atrocities yet to come. Maybe that's why Missy led me here. Maybe she wanted me to help her put an end to all of this. We're here because this is the only place for people like us. Might as well get used to it. Michael offered me the knife, and I instinctually shielded the child with my arms, backing away from him. Kill it now! His voice was edged with a sudden intensity. Quick! We give up! I shouted to no one in particular. Whoever is watching, we give up. This is as far as we can go. Elijah, you idiot! Give it to me then! No, I won't let you! Michael lunged at us with the knife, but I managed to scramble out of the way. I lost my balance on the uneven stones and fell straight onto my arse though. I covered the child with my body, but had to let go a moment later, as a piercing pain like a fistful of needles was gorging into my hand. The infant had latched onto me with unnatural ferocity. It shouldn't have even had teeth yet, but I could clearly see multiple rows of razor edges burrowing into my skin. I screamed and strained to pull it off, but every movement did nothing but give it a fresh angle to burrow further. Bash it against the wall, Michael shouted. I did so, again and again, beating the tiny body into the stone, feeling the fragile bones inside splinter with every iteration. The grip finally began to slacken, until finally, I was able to stomp the tiny creature's body and rip my bloody hands free. It almost looked reptilian where it lay on the ground, its yellow eyes boring into me as they closed to slits. Welcome home, master, croaked the dr croaked the dying monstrosity. Ready now? Michael asked, handing me the knife once more. I didn't hesitate this time. I plunged it straight into chest and tore a long hole straight down into its navel. A hot mess of insides oozed out and I had to actually dig my fingers into it to retrieve the bronze key. It bled profusely from a dozen puncture wounds. 
I wrapped it as best I could with one of my extra t-shirts, but I can only imagine what ghastly infections might come from those wounds. I don't know whether it was loss of blood or horror of this place, but I felt so lightheaded that I almost toppled the second I stood upright. Come on now, easy there. I was surprised by the gentleness in Michael's tone as he helped me to my feet. We're in this together, so let's do it right. We both want to get to this school, right? I nodded meekly, allowing him to guide me to the door. Then let's not give up before we have to, he said. I, for one, am looking forward to seeing how far this rabbit hole goes. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I really hope that you enjoyed tonight's extra long video. One of these creepy pastors, the Assassin's Orphanage one, was actually one of my favourites, and when I released it about two or three months ago, I was surprised that not a lot of you were actually that into it, so for those of you who missed it, I hope you enjoyed it this time round. If there's a story that you would like to share, all that you need to do is send it to me via email or share it to my Reddit. Please remember to paragraph your stories, include plenty of punctuation, and paragraphs are your friend. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.